Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us at the Future of Strategy event and welcome to our working lunch, Growing Roots, facilitating international trade, Roots for SMEs. We're going to be exploring the opportunities and barriers which SMEs face when beginning to export for the first time and also for experienced exporters as they look to enter new markets. We have a fantastic group of panellists with, with us today to explore this space. However, this is an opportunity for you to get involved as well. So please do contribute by posting your questions in the group chat function. I'd like to just kick off by introducing the panel. So if I can ask each of you just to give a brief overview of who you are and what you do. I think um, we'll start with Mark, who has very kindly woken up at 7.30 a.m. to speak on our panel and to give us his view from the States. Thanks, Mark. Hi, Amy. Thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity. So my name is Mark Reid. I'm the head of trade for Invest Northern Ireland. We're the, the, uh, the devolved administration for the, the government of Northern Ireland, the Economic Development Agency for Northern Ireland. Uh, and our role is to help our companies grow around the world. We have offices um, from Belfast, as far away as Japan, to Sydney, and then our, on this side of the Atlantic, we're covering the United States, Canada, and Latin America, and I'm based in Miami. So our role is to help grow jobs in Northern Ireland and also create wealth and exports for, for our exporters and, and our, our manufacturers. And uh, my role is to identify the opportunities and to make sure we connect them to the right companies. And of course, as we will chat today, uh, try and help uh, on, navigate the barriers and the problems of doing so. And um, so that's our role. Thanks, Mark. Alison? Hi, everyone. My name is Alison Young, and I'm a global export and investment specialist with the Connected Places Catapult. Um, the CPC, I'll refer to it as that because it's a mouthful otherwise, <laughs> is the UK's innovation accelerator for mobility and the built environment, so smart cities. Um, there are nine catapults in the UK, and we are one of them. Um, and I sit in the global team, and we help, um, well, we do projects internationally focusing on mobility and smart cities, but we help um, UK UK SMEs access new markets through these projects um, and in the UK we also um, you know help SMEs um, access opportunities and, and the supply chain um, within the UK. Thanks Alison. Paul? Good afternoon everyone I'm Paul O'Donnell I'm Public Affairs Director at the Institute of Export and International Trade. Uh, we are we are a UK registered charity and we're the UK's leading provider of uh, training for uh, international trade and qualifications for international trade. We're an Ofqual uh, recognized awarding body, uh, awarding qualifications from level two up to level seven. So that's uh, introductory stuff up to uh, up to master's level. Um, we also uh, do a, have a consultancy arm uh, that aids, that uh, supports companies and public sector organizations uh, in delivering and supporting international trade right around the world. Thank you, Thank you. Paul. Francisco? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Francisca Michielsen, um, Director for Trade and Supplier Finance uh, at Santander Corporate and Commercial Banking in the UK. Um, we're focusing on supporting SMEs and larger corporates um, with their trade and supplier finance. Um, our bank is internationally with great presence in Europe and the Americas, and we benefit from a great network of partner banks as well. So we're, we're, we're well placed to support international and, and trade finance business and, and focusing on the SME and, and mid-market. Thank you, Francisca. Okay, so let's get started and I'll, I'll ask this as a question for all the panel, kicking off with Mark, please. Um, can I ask what each of you feel from your interaction with SMEs are the main barriers to businesses who want to trade internationally? Um, yeah, well, um, from a more operational perspective, trying to get overseas is, is, is a great opportunity. And I know we'll probably focus on a little bit of Latin America. So opportunities out there, but understanding what is it and trying to get your find a local partner is going to represent you or whatever sector you might be in. So um, understanding the overseas market, who are the competitors, getting all that market information, because in, in, intelligence is everything. So being able to understand the overseas market, and then um, how, how would you actually identify your partners? Then you got all the other items like um, exchange rate, import duties, and shipping times, etc. So, and of course, then um, standards and regulations. So there, there's many, many uh, factors to consider, um, but that's all surmountable. Everything can be 
um, everything can be found out and we can certainly in our role anyway we, we can certainly assist with trying to identify all those issues and that's part of what we do so those are a lot of operational problems and maybe hope that answers some of the questions thanks mark allison well, i think that's a great answer from mark he's covered a lot of them but i think one of the things that um that we tend to see and i've seen as well is um is i think funding um, to help SMEs access new markets, maybe going out to trade shows, obviously pre-COVID times, um, it can be expensive, um, but it's it's sometimes really important because a lot of a lot of these places, relationships and face-to-face -face sort of you know meetings are very important, and I think that um, sometimes it's it's really expensive, and I think the access to funding to be able to go out to trade shows and, and to join maybe trade missions that people are putting on, um, I think I think having more access to that would be really helpful because that's a great introduction to, to new markets as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Paul? Um. I think uh, I think those are both you know, really, really, really good points um, and things that uh, that I think I'd echo. I think I think we'd perhaps see it in terms of some of the barriers that are, are, are around lacks of knowledge, and it's what Mark was talking about, which is kind of lack of knowledge of a market. And again, you can go out, you can find that out. Uh, you know, Mark's role is you know telling people about the wonderful market that is Northern Ireland, uh, but you know there are markets right around the globe, and you know there, there, there is a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of expertise out there that SMEs can tap. But actually, there's also another knowledge gap, which is the knowledge of how to do international trade. So the knowledge of you know what inco terms are right for you, what's the tax position, how am I going to get paid? Those sorts of things are some of the um, some of the some of the operational challenges that can put off SMEs, and I think that you know that's something that people you know companies very often come to us. Uh, to help them solve, um, there's a lack of perhaps a lack of skills uh, in the uh, in the international trade marketplace. And again, that's something that companies can come to us and solve. Um, and uh, you know, our members, because we're we're a, we're a membership body, uh, you know, have the uh, have the advice uh, from our helpline and the advice from our experts on tap. So you know, it is you know there is there is a lot to know. Um, there is you know things that you do have to find out. There are things that you know are done differently um in different overseas markets um but it shouldn't it needn't necessarily be scary and there are lots of places that you can go to uh, to find help thanks paul i'm sure we'll come on to later how the institute of exporters can support um, smes and businesses with that knowledge gap in terms of their skills and finally then for cisco what's the main barrier that you see to businesses um, uh, th there's, there's good overlap and interestingly Santander has just uh, launched their latest trade barometer where we interview and, and survey over a thousand uh, commercial and corporate businesses um, and the four key barriers are uh, the right overseas connections which Mark touched upon, um, mm -hmm. bureaucracy still a, a large barrier um, struggling to attract and to retain the right staff with the international skills and i think paul that's overlapping with uh, training desire as well and also increasingly and we've seen that over the last 18 months is the um, exporters being increasingly worried about logistical cost particularly trading overseas and uh, supply chain uh, pressures and changing supply chains you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of overlap um, and, and, and all, I think, uh, pressing um, uh, hurdles. Absolutely, all very relevant barriers to SMEs um, in, the, in the challenging um, space of export. Um, Mark, just to pick up with you um, regarding your barrier that you mentioned around understanding the marketplace, what information and that data are you aware of or is available for businesses out there that could be useful in supporting SMEs decide on whether or not to export into a particular market or indeed at all and deciding on where to export to? Um, yeah, so we have our, our own network of offices and staff around the world and we use our own teams to develop market intelligence. Um, we also have a third party network that we call Trade Advisory Service, which um, is a paid service, but as part of being a devolved administration, we support that service. So we we will have some general sector information, but mostly we work on a one-to-one -one client base. The company we call client companies clients, and we'll we'll engage with the company. We'll understand what their product is. We'll understand maybe what's unique about their product, and then try to help understand their route to the market. 
the best way to find their distribution channel on this side of the Atlantic. And then when it comes to, to Latin America, um, it, it's a very broad territory. There's there's 37 countries with lots of different exchange rates and different opportunities, but it's emerging. There's opportunity for everything, but we try to narrow down and focus in the areas that we're strong in in Northern Ireland, and then we can help that company enter. Say we have an office in Santiago in Chile, um, but we have a network of trade providers with boots on the ground as well. So we can gather the information, but we technically work usually on, on a one-to-one -one basis with a client and help them develop a, a market entry plan. Interesting. That's a very bespoke um, way to engage with clients, which is super interesting. I'm sure super helpful to your clients as well. I'll just extend that question out to the rest of the panel as well. You know, what data sources are you aware of that can support businesses um, in, in deciding where to export to? Alison, do you want to pick up next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there is actually a lot of information out there. Um, and interestingly, um, Santander do fantastic um, reports and, and, you know, PwC, you know, a lot of the big four, a lot of the banks, um, there are fantastic um, country reports, and they drill down into specific sectors. Um, and you've got business councils who hold maybe free events as well as chambers of commerce. Um, you know, DIT will have, have um, and, and you know, you've got Invest NI, SDI, um, the Welsh government, there, there will be there will be free information there as well. But I think for me, a lot of the, um, the best kind of overviews of, of overseas markets tend to be from, from the banks and, and the kind of big consultancy companies. Um, and there are some fantastic resources out there, but you sometimes just have to look for them if you're doing your research around specific markets. Hmm, thanks, Alison. Francisca, I'll just come to you then following that, because I think Alison might have done a bit of a shameless plug for you there. Um, <laughs> what, what sort of data is Alison talking about? What does Santander offer in that regard? Um, well, yeah, Alison touched upon on sector expertise and and uh, international expertise, um, focusing on particular countries. And I think um, tapping into your service network, be it banks, accountants, lawyers, can be very helpful. At Santander specifically, I mentioned we, you know, we're 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 a big bank. We have a fantastic uh, international network, and we have strong sector knowledge. Um, and we also um, have a great ecosystem where, you know, in every country we're based, we work with lawyers, we work with accountants, um, and we try to uh, facilitate warm introductions for our clients overseas into the right sector specialist, into um, the right network. Um, and I think that ecosystem is there. Uh, but you know, need to know how to tap into it, and we need to make that easy for our customers. So one way we do that is we have what we call a dedicated multinational team that facilitates those introductions. They speak the languages, um, they go into uh, the right teams immediately, they share information where, where possible, um, and that's where we can really make a difference for our customers. Thank you. And Paul, do you have anything to add in terms of what the IOE might be able to offer there? I'll give you a shameless plug for our Doing Business Insight uh, series of guides, uh, which are which are freely available on our website. Um, so that's, they're a really good source of information for about 60 uh, different markets across the world. Um, <laughs> And then again, for our, for our members, we're, we're, you know, we're happy to produce, um, you know, we, 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 we can advise people, we can you know, give them information via our helplines, we can give them via information via sort of our communities of practice, we can put people in touch with each other. Um, but actually, I'd, 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 I'd also add something, you know, from an SME point of view, if you're looking at, you know, new markets to, to, you know, to attack is, where are your, where, where, where are your competitors? Start looking around that, do, do some, you know, some really good competitor analysis. And that will often, you know, turn up where they're strong, uh, or you know, where 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 they've identified a market, because that you know, that's quite likely to be something that uh, uh, that you might be able to attack as well. I think that's really good advice. And um, regarding the competitor research, Paul, I've, I've never actually thought of that before. And another shameless plug, I guess, from us at Coriolis. Um, while we're in the shameless plugs, we might as well keep them rolling. Um, we have a risk opportunity and scoring tool for companies looking to target new markets, and we're offering a free trial of that during the course of the Future of Strategy Week. So um, I think my colleague Lee is going to post some details in the group chat regarding that. 
Um, Paul and Mark, there's a question from the audience for you um, from a renewable energy manufacturing and engineering firm, and they're interested in exporting into the US. And they're wondering, how do you help, how could you help them as an organization? First, for me, I'd have to make sure if the company is actually from Northern Ireland, uh, <laughs> obviously the, the various where the company is based. We just because of the nature of being the devolved administration, we can we would only help Northern Ireland companies. Um, but if they're if they're Belfast based, great. So we would love to reach out to Tom, have a chat with you. Um, we would engage with you first of all, understand your product, what's unique. And then work out what they understand where the market is for you in the states what the market would look like and always when it comes to the us where we're all very conscious that the us is a is basically 50 countries it's massive so you have to take it bite at a time so we'll work out where the right fit is to get started in the states it could be up in the northeast depending on what the product is and where the buyer demographics might be and then what we do the next step is operational we try to identify what, depending on what the product is who the um, dealers or buyers or the, the, the route to market would be. And we'll identify a potential, a list of potential first time buyers, et cetera, and we'll connect them to the exporter. And um, that's usually the, 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 the quickest way to get started. Um, many other factors around it, but very generalized there, but that's kind of how we would help. And then we'd also engage in market readiness with the company as well, determine if the product's right, et cetera. And we have skills workshops in Belfast to do that as well. Thanks, Mark. Paul? Um, I think the support that we could give, uh, Tom, I don't, I, I, I don't know if, you're, uh, if your company's a member or if you're an individual member of the Institute, but I think the support that we could give would be following very much on from the, from the, uh, uh, the things that Mark's um, talked about. So, you know, perhaps once you've identified that market, then we can help you in when it comes to getting things across through, through US customs. We can help you with getting paid. We can help you with understanding the sort of the right the, um, the right inco terms, we can we can also potentially help you if you need to send people uh, to the US to uh, uh, to work on particular contracts or particular projects. You know that stuff that we can you know we 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 can make the, the, that 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 advice available to members. Thanks, Paul. And then right. I guess more generally from Alison and Francisca, what do your organisations do to offer you know support? To offer businesses who are new to exporting who want to perhaps identify or trade with new markets? Um, well, I think from the, the CPC's um, uh, perspective, we have an SME net network. And I would really suggest if you if you sit within the kind of mobility and smart city um, space, sign up to the SME network and I can share it in the chat later. Um, but that's where we share details of we have um, a monthly connections cafe to talk about things that might affect you, you know, from from kind of procurement through to regulations um, that might be more UK focused. Um, but we also share open calls that we have for projects and programs that we are looking for um, solutions to in the UK but also overseas um, and it, it's 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 really helpful there's also the other catapult so if you're kind of within that kind of say high value manufacturing or offshore wind energy um, there are other catapults who will have their own kind of SME networks and and again maybe that's something to share at the end of this but really really useful um, there's a lot of information there there's a lot of events there's a lot of um, opportunities and programs within the UK and and overseas um, we've also got a lot of reports that we do um, we did one recently on free ports and the opportunities that are coming up um, around that from a maritime um, and green port perspective. Um, and so I would just say if, if you're in that space, check out the website, have a look, have a look what we're kind of what we're doing, because there is a lot and we've got a great SME team who, again, will if, if you're a UK based company and you sign up to the network, they will speak to you, they'll understand what you're doing, how to, you know, where to signpost you for opportunities. Um, and yeah, that, that's my shameless plug. Thanks, Alison, and please do share that in the group chat. And Francisca? Yeah, um, oh, I touched upon the right connections already um, and, and, and a strong international and, and sector network. And it's then about how do we bring that to our customer base in the most efficient uh, and, and easy way. So we're working very hard to set that up via the right digital tools and to, to customize it. And artificial intelligence will be a great help to that. 
Now, from a trade finance perspective, a bank is really ideally placed to uh, support SMEs with, with the overseas risk, assessing the risk and mitigating those risks as well via trade finance instruments, for example, import letters of credit. So what I would um, ask anyone who's considering it, have an early discussion with your bank because they can support, they can identify the risk and they will help you to mitigate this where necessary. Thanks, thanks, Jessica. And I think from the conversations we've been having with banks and trade finance organisations this week, I think coming early to a bank has been a really prevalent um, takeaway point. Following on from that then, um, what more potentially could be done from your sector as a whole or indeed your organisation to break down barriers for businesses starting to export? And before I come to the panel, like we definitely will welcome some comments from the audience in this one. So if you're an SME or a trade finance professional and you have some ideas on how some of these organisations could support businesses more than please do drop that in the group chat. Mark, I'll come to you first. Um, well, I think there's always the, um, the, the worry about going overseas, going to new markets where you might get exposed to risk and issues like, will I get paid, et cetera. So there's, there's probably we can do maybe more to try and educate a little bit on, on the various um, uh, the countries and doing business with the various countries. There's a lot of countries out there, of course, but and each country will have its own individual uh, standards and regulations as well. And, and some countries, mostly in healthcare and food and beverage, of course, those standard regulations are, will vary and there's different agencies in different countries. So it's, it's probably maybe just trying to build up more confidence and maybe we can put in more ways to try and help companies have, have, have more confidence in doing business overseas. Although generally speaking, most companies are, are very keen to export, but maybe just a little bit if we could do more on the, on the, the operational aspects of understanding those sort of risk areas. Alison. Um, so one of the things we're doing at the moment, we've got a number of really exciting decarbonisation um, of transport projects that we're doing. And part of the work is actually scoping where the UK supply chain is currently, what the UK capabilities are, um, the solutions that we offer, that we have, that are maybe being um, you know, researched and developed. Um, and actually understand how we can work with, with UK companies to sort of build, build out that capability and capacity to obviously have opportunities within, within the UK, but then also um, give them access to opportunities globally. So part of the project um, looking at the UK supply chain is also looking at well, where, where are the um, similar projects going on overseas, focusing on decarbonisation of transport that we can then kind of create opportunities for the, for the UK kind of SME network. Um, so definitely, definitely through that, I think is, is one of the ways that we're trying to kind of look at these future technologies and open up new opportunities. But I will welcome any suggestions because I think there's always more that we can do. Absolutely. Thanks, Alison. And Paul? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, we would aim to, to support companies, as, as, um, as I said, through, through training in particular and support and qualifications. One thing that we have been able to do over the last sort of 18 months or so, uh, increasingly helpful to SMEs, uh, has been uh, working through um, a government funded program called the UK Customs Academy, uh, which has been able to train uh, 9,000 uh, people in customs practices and practicing. Uh, and that's been a huge, uh, hugely successful uh, initiative that's, uh, that's had government funding. Uh, and that we've been able to deliver and that's all, you know, that, that's all been uh, uh, online training um, and we've been really been able to, uh, to add to the, uh, uh, the, the skill stock, if you like, of, uh, of UK SMEs in that way. Mm, thanks. And Francisca, maybe more specifically to this point in terms of the banking sector, there's been a lot of narrative recently surrounding the trade finance gap for SMEs and Standard, Standard Charter recently reported that it now stands at around $1.7 trillion, which is huge. So um, can you explain to us a bit about, you know, what is the trade finance gap? What does it mean? And what is the banking sector or indeed Santander specifically offering to SMEs who have aspirations of exporting? Um, that, that gap is mentioned an, an awful lot, um, Amy. And um, it's, it's not a gap which is in finance. It, it will be financed, but it may be not financed in the right ways. It might be financed by um, credit card companies. Um, it might be financed at the wrong rate. 
um, we are living in a digital world and there's there's plenty of opportunities um, to, to, to support companies. I think we need to have the right conversations with the client. As you say at an early stage, Alison touched upon climate change and, and being carbon neutral. How can we support our customers in the journey to either start exporting or transition into a more sustainable um, supply chain and, and how can we support them with those early discussions are um, very important. Thank you. Alison, I'll just come to you next um, with this one then. So the trade finance gap is obviously particularly evident in developing markets, but also closer to home in the SMEs and regions outside major cities often report a lack of interest from investors and indeed reduced access to exporting opportunities. What is Catapult doing to support SMEs in regions outside of London or at the levelling up agenda as we hear from DIT? And how can the wider trade finance ecosystem support this journey and the distribution of economic productivity? It's a big question and um, I think there is a lot going on. Um, part of our sort of um, strategy is very much focusing on levelling up. Um, whatever that means, we've chosen it to mean, you know, kind of making sure that areas outside of, of London and some of the other big cities receive this sort of same level of investment. And one of the things that we're doing is looking at um, innovation hubs. So we're looking at how to attract more investment into innovation um, around the UK. Um, and that will be kind of uh, sort of a, a cluster. So it might it might hook around, say, university and, and then kind of spin out from there, or it might hook around a sort of business district, because obviously innovation um, districts look different. Um, that's at kind of earlier stage, but we're very much trying to see well where can where can we add value from that mobility and smart city um, perspective, and, and obviously bring the SMEs along and, and look at, at, at how they can um, access more, more funding, more finance. Um, places like interestingly, um, and it, it's obviously still in its kind of inception, but the Oxcam Arc that's been discussed for a, a long time. Um, they have um, an organization called um, Arc Angels, I think, and that's and that's sort of bringing together um, angel investors um, to invest um, into uh, startup scale ups within within that kind of um, area. And that's that's quite exciting. And I think there probably need to be more initiatives like that that we need to look into and, and back and, and kind of. Um, that's quite an exciting um, opportunity for that ecosystem. Um, but one of the things we're actually doing is um, something called the UK Cities, um, UK, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, UK Cities Climate Investment um, uh, Challenge or something. I'm sorry, I've probably got that totally wrong. Um, but we're basically looking at how we can help UK cities attract more investment um, to help them kind of develop and grow their net zero um, and clean growth um, kind of capacity and capability. And obviously SMEs will be heavily involved in that, um, but there's a huge kind of public funding gap. So, so that funding to kind of bring cities along on, on that journey um, has to come from elsewhere. So that's another thing. And again, I'll share that, sorry for getting the name so wrong, um, but that's, that's a new initiative that has just been launched. Um, and again, I think it could have, um, exciting um, sort of implications for SMEs and, and how to kind of attract more funding um, kind of into the regions. Thanks Alison, that did sound like quite mouthful. Um, thanks for that. Um, Mark, you obviously work for one of these levelling up regions in um, Northern Ireland, indeed work where I'm from, and I think one of the businesses in the audience is definitely Belfast based. So you're essentially um, responsible for the export growth of Northern Irish businesses into some emerging and challenging markets, for example, Latin and South America. What are some of the main opportunities and barriers for exporting SMEs wanting to trade with such countries? And how do economic development agencies like Invest Northern Ireland support businesses in, for example, understanding regularly requirements, overcoming those barriers and, and making the most out of the opportunities that emerging markets present? Okay, I mean, probably need a lot of time to answer that one completely, but in, in, in general terms, so um, Latin America is a, 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 a region of tremendous opportunity. Um, 26 of the nations have got free trade agreements now with the United Kingdom. And indeed, Chile was the first country in the world to sign up, it's actually re-signed a free trade agreement. So there's an awful lot of um, opportunity to leverage there right away in the free trade agreements. Um, 
some of the, the a lot of the governments are also spending now on infrastructure to get back out re, recover from um, the impacts of COVID. So there's a lot of money being spent on infrastructure. So anybody in the infrastructure sector, uh, there there's a lot of opportunity, and we we know where those opportunities are. And we we through our network say we have our own office in Santiago in Chile, but we work also with DIT, which is I, I guess in many ways our big brother, which got their offices in every country across the region. And I guess we've also got our our third party providers that can work on individual countries. Um, as it's emerging, there is tremendous, with there are more people getting more wealth, they want to have better healthcare services, tremendous opportunities in the healthcare industry because people want better healthcare. And then there's more money to spend, so there's lots of opportunity in retail as well. Um, the barriers are uh, the same. Again, most of the companies are now have got free trade agreements. Barriers, though, would be, as I mentioned earlier, things like standards and regulations. Each country will have its own set of regulations for again, anything related to healthcare, anything that's consumed, that have an agency, but we know how to connect with those agencies and, and help to massage that process through in many ways. And, and also with the likes of Brazil and Mexico, that with their agencies have actually, some of the most of them have been to Northern Ireland. So we, we can certainly assist with trying to understand and how to get through the, the standards and regulations processes. Uh, and then it's just the other areas that the, the typical operational, that the shipping, shipping lead times to the to the Latin America, they're not as long as you would think. They're actually because they can go through the Panama Canal, so it's actually not a, a long shipping time in many ways. But you do have that shipping time to consider. But the, also the good news is that Brazil and Mexico are highly industrialized, but the, the majority of Latin American countries um, are very accustomed to importing. So it's, you're, you're not trying to break any new ground here. That the, the, A lot of product has already been imported and companies, they're, they're really open to do business. Um, so you've got to think about, okay, if I get my, how, how do I find my partner? Which again, we can help to identify potential partners. And then how do you get paid? How am I going to ship, if I get my ship my product to, to Peru, am I going to get paid? And I guess uh, the, the team on the, the rest of the panel are more experts in that area than I am, but there's a lot of the, the traditional payment methods, as the solid ones of the old five letters of credit extended terms or credit insurance, et cetera. Um, so th there's many different, each country is very individual, but again, we, we work on a very customized one-on-one -on -one basis with the, the companies from, from Northern Ireland. We work out plans and then we'll structure a plan to help that company get into that certain country. So. Um, and of course, language, <laughs> language. Um, the good news is that most people that you'll deal on an international basis, most people in Latin America will actually speak English. So um, there's, I, I wouldn't let language be a barrier of anybody thinking to go to Latin America. Um, so many, many other answers. I hope I address some of the, the items. Absolutely, Mark. Thank you so much for that. And really interesting, I think, and positive to hear about the number of opportunities and growing sectors and opportunities specifically for businesses and um, wanting to export into those countries, not just barriers. Francisca, maybe I'll just come to you on, on one of Mark's points there around, you know, getting paid from these countries and, and what Santander or banks in general can do to facilitate that. And is there much of a movement towards the digitization of, of those types of things like letter of credits, et cetera? Um, two questions. One, uh, is about what can banks do and what have we done traditionally and what we will continue to do and what then your second question, what are, how are we improving uh, the processes and, and digitalizing uh, the instruments uh, to, to better facilitate um, uh, businesses. Uh, banks can do an awful lot um, and we can mitigate most financing risks, but it, it it's, it's against the cost. So um, it's for the exporter to assess, you know, what the risk is and, and, and the risk reward. And what you see with uh, most, if not all of our clients, they go through a journey where they establish new counterparties, um, where um, they are not yet familiar, there's not yet a positive track record and they want uh, confidence that they will get paid or that their goods are arriving, so they will use trade instruments. And then when those relationships develop and there's a good track record and there is trust, um, the 
risk mitigants might be loosened because there's a cost to that. <coughs> Excuse me. And what you've seen over the last one and a half year with changes in supply chain that our customers actually are looking for more risk mitigants again. Um, and there's more pressure on the supply chains. There have been more companies um, struggling. Now, what um, the industry in the sector is doing is trying to digitalize some of the instruments that have been there for hundreds of years to, to digitalize those instruments. And you can only do that if um, uh, the digitalization is embedded in law. So for example, uh, a bill of exchange is still a physical document and that needs to be embedded in law to be able to have the same, um, uh, offer the same security as this is a physical instrument. And the difficulty is here that uh, that will then need to not only be embedded in UK law, but in every country in an international law. And, and that progress is happening and it's been happening for a while, but it is now accelerating. You have an awful lot of uh, fintech providers and also banks that are uh, launching these um, uh, digital initiatives. Um, without the, the laws necessarily yet in place and are testing these. So I think over the next two years, you see a real move into uh, digitally accepted um, uh, instruments. Thank you, Francisca. Um, sticking with the international um, export theme, but moving perhaps to the more developed countries, a particularly prevalent topic, which has been possibly slightly overshadowed by the dreaded C word is Brexit. So Paul, I'd like to come to you around what opportunities and barriers are presented by Brexit to SMEs and what work are you doing in your role of public affairs around lobbying for your members? Well, I think you know, clearly there have been, um, how should we put this, challenges in terms of uh, exporting uh, to, uh, to the EU post-Brexit. Um, and those changes are not all over, by the way. Um, there are still things that there are still easements in place that are due to expire, principally on the importing side rather than the exporting side, to be fair. Uh, but there are still easements in place that are, uh, are coming off next year. Um, so companies really do need to be uh, do need to be fully aware of all the things that are, that are that are coming up, uh, uh, coming up to uh, uh, to hit them. But, you know, we've had um, we've seen huge growth in um, the number of people who or people and companies have been joining us we've seen huge growth in the number of companies that have been doing our training courses and our qualifications um, as I said we were worked through uh, using government funding to deliver a, a UK customs academy um, and you know we've worked really really hard and you know traders up and down the country have worked really really hard to try and keep supply chains open to, to try and keep goods moving and by and large you know that's been that's been relatively successful um, of course well, this has all also been undercut by the phenomenon of COVID, um, which particularly at the time of the first lockdown had very substantial um, uh, disruptions to trade patterns. And then that's that's then rippled and fed back and rippled and fed back. Um, and we've seen some of the difficulties that, uh, that, 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 that have been seen you know, right across the world um, uh, in the last uh, in the last few months. Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of preparing companies for Brexit, you know, a lot of a lot of work was done, uh, you know, this time this time a year ago, and then particularly in the first three months of this year, um, to try and get traders as ready as possible. Um, and you know, I think it would be uh, it would it it would be foolish to pretend that you know that 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 impact has been you know negligible or or you know or even minimal. Um, but you know, we have seen and we have been able to support traders to keep trading. Uh, and to keep those uh, uh, keep those links alive. Thanks, Paul. I don't know if any of the rest of the panel want to come in on that. Could I just could, sorry? Could I could I yeah. just really um, echo something uh, that Francisca said uh, a minute ago about digitalization um, and the prospects for digitalization of trade, uh, particularly over the next couple of years. Um, uh, Francisca quite rightly pointed out to the uh, the legal um, framework changes that are happening uh, probably in the UK next year and around the world in sort of the G7 and G20 countries over the next couple of years, which I think are really, I think we're really on the cusp of seeing digital technologies to sort of you know, disrupt trade uh, in a way that other industries have been have been disrupted by trade. Um, and you know, it's, it's something that's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's perhaps a tiny bit frightening to some companies, but it's also very exciting uh, in terms of the opportunities that are there. And actually, you know, 
it will make uh, cross-border economic activity um, or trade, as we sometimes call it, uh, an easier thing to do and actually hopefully a less scary thing to do uh, for companies because, you know, if, if it's, um, you know, if it can be facilitated online, then you know, it will be uh, a much less complicated and a much less daunting uh, prospect for them. So I'm you know, looking forward to uh, to those improvements over the next next couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, you know, as a technology company in this space, we're definitely looking forward to the disruption of um, how digitalization is going to change the, the trade landscape and the trade finance landscape over the next few years. Um, just to move on then, I guess, to a, a highly current topic, and as we all know, COP26 is taking over our headlines and social media feeds at the moment. In light of COP26 and the raised awareness around sustainable trade and trade finance, Francisca, can I just come to you about how is the banking sector responding to encourage clients to source um, from sustainable sources and also, you know, how are banks moving to a more sustainable trade finance model? First of all, we need we need a global uh, ESG standard um, and uh, avoid greenwashing. And I think all the banks are very conscious of that. Um, and, and the banks, everyone has to do the right thing um, for the planet. Um, I think if you refer to, to COP, it is hugely positive that, um, that a new global ESG standards body has been launched. Um, to combat that greenwashing um, and, and, and really focusing on enhancing business climate related disclosures. And, and that will help. And I think uh, the aim is to uh, release um, um, those, um, call it um, rules in 2022. And, and that's really uh, relevant for buying because um, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And we better have everyone measuring it in the same way. Uh, but we cannot wait for those standards to, standards to come into to force. So, so what do we do? We actively engage with our clients on the topic and help try to support them in their journey to um, build a more sustainable uh, supply chain. So we, we, you know, we start to ask questions around what's, what's, what's your perceived impact on climate change on your business and how do you build more future-proof uh, supply chains and how can we support you with that from a financing perspective. And as with clients starting to um, trade internationally for the first time, you know, that, that's something we want to support. We want to support clients actively changing their supply chains and therefore trading with new counterparties so we, we, we need to stand really behind that and, and build our um, policies and procedures uh, for that. Um, and um, it, it, I think what, what you'll see with, with any disrupting factor, it's, it's the, the multinationals that you know, make the noise, they report on it, um, but it's the SMEs that can make a real difference in it. So um, as a bank, we really need to support the SMEs in that journey. Absolutely. And um, at Coriolis, we're working on an ESG standardization um, and um, tool to sort of standardize and assess ESG. And I know that Santander are coming along and, and participating in our working groups rounding, you know, the scoring methodology that goes into that. What do we weight it against? And, and we're looking at you know, UN sustainability development goals. We're looking at EU taxonomy, which is coming in, green taxonomy, and um, which will come into the US, etc. I think that's a highly um, relevant topic, Francisco. Thank you. It is, and it, and it's complex. So we can't, you know, we we won't have a solution tomorrow. We need to take time. But but I think um, COP twenty six will accelerate it, which is fantastic, and it will accelerate it throughout every sector and throughout every segment. Um, so very, very keen to, to support the initiative of Coriolis as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Francisca. And Alison, then I'll just come to you staying in this topic um, around net zero. And obviously, um, net zero commitments are going to require a, a huge investment for both public and private sector organisations over the next so many years to hit the targets. What innovative strategies are being thought of um, to finance net zero? And how can SMEs become a part of this movement and contribute to the green recovery? So I think um, 
more in, well, COP26 has been really useful, I think, from a global perspective, getting governments to really be more proactive about, about net zero commitments, about the projects that they're running. Um, we're seeing so much so much more coming out of the, the kind of markets that we operate in, in terms of, of sort of, um, you know, wider net zero commitments, um, projects, maybe it's around hydrogen, which I know is still a controversial one, uh, maybe it's around kind of clean energies, um, there's a lot more focus on it, which is really positive because it means there will be those kind of opportunities in the pipeline coming up for UK SMEs. Um, I think in terms of funding, I mean, I've mentioned um, the UK Cities Climate Investment Commission, which I shared and I got right that time. Um, that will be something that we're looking at that I think might have kind of um, implications for the funding for um, SMEs kind of um, and, and their kind of greener, um, technologies and solutions within within the supply chain. Um, I think projects that we're running um, a couple of years ago, we did a really exciting one with um, Amy and um, Staffordshire County Council. And it was kind of a live test bed um, sort of around a, a train station, but a lot of the, the technologies that were there, you know, some of it was a, um, a MOS carbon sink wall, you know, and so that's not your typical, it's not just something to do with a car or, or a lorry, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of those, these wider, um, solutions um and we're just seeing a lot more interest i think from from a lot of a lot of places and i think i think there will be funding that comes up over the next few years that that really allow um whether it's cities whether it's kind of um private companies to actually move forward with a lot of these projects so we're quite hopeful um through some of the things that we're doing um as well big focus on decarbonisation and transport. Um, we obviously got the UK free ports, which we haven't mentioned yet, but a huge part of, of kind of the free ports business plan is really focusing on trade and investment and innovation. And so I think I think there's going to be a huge focus around green technologies within these free ports. Um, and that could be that could be really exciting for the um, uh, for UK SMEs for the supply chain. And we're seeing interest, I think, from large scale overseas investors in some of these larger infrastructure projects. So again, that could be quite positive um, going forward. Absolutely. Thanks, Alison. Paul, Mark, I don't know if you want to come in on any of those points. Perhaps Mark, some of the R&D funding that Invest Northern Ireland offer. Um, and how that's affecting sort of the innovation or the green space or, or Paul, anything that the Institute of Exporters do in training in that regard? Um, uh, we're yeah. looking, oh, uh, we're yeah. looking at developing uh, training as, as Francisca said, I think, I think the, um, uh, the beginning of an establishment of standard of uh, global standards um, is, is a really important step. Um, and I think we're going to be looking Really quite urgently around how we can train people to uh, uh, to meet those standards uh, and to you know to, to to embed those standards into 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 their businesses. Um, and I'd also perhaps take take this opportunity just to just to flag up some of the good work that UKEF have done um, in this space as well um, in terms of sustainable technologies and uh, sustainable companies uh, and looking uh, looking to support them with funding as well. I don't know if Mark wants to. Uh, well, no, no clean energy. Uh, um is obviously very interesting for us as well renewables um with, with, we're very proud to have right bus uh from northern ireland which is leading the world in, in hydrogen hydrogen powered buses so with regards to r d um we're getting to terry which is, is not, not my familiarity because i'm an, an exports but of course r d for northern ireland is very strong it's a very it's one of our main drivers uh for bringing inward investment um a, a lot from the united states as well um, we're also part of City Deals, where we're developing the Advanced Manufacturing Technology Centre, um, bringing in many technologies from composites through to uh, advanced advanced manufacturing, etc., to, to to help companies uh, explore and, and, and innovate within the, the sector. So it's an area that we, we're certainly developing um, and developing quite fast. So Northern Ireland is becoming very interesting uh, as a centre, as a as a location for inward investment for um, renewables as well. Thanks, Mike. And then just to come back to a question um, from one of the audience here in the chat, um, it's specifically addressed, I think, to, to Mark or Paul. So if either of you could pick this up, but equally if Francesca or Alison want to come in on it. Um, are there any restrictions on where I can export to if I import materials and component parts from China and Russia? He said that he believes that there are issues with importing from China before exporting adapted or modified goods to, say, the US. Uh, yes, there are some restrictions, um, and 
it was very very important that you get across those because you know it's 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 quite they take them extremely seriously and yeah um i think it, it it surrounds restrictions that are in particular to, to particular technologies um i don't know if what tom's uh using is uh is a potential dual use technology um or if it's got potential accuracy issue or potential accuracy uh criteria um, but that's though the, the, there, there, there are issues around those and then there are also issues around particular uh companies and economic entities uh in china and particularly russia uh that are uh, subject to uh, us sanctions so it is quite an important uh thing and i've i've i've, I've popped a link in the chat tom uh, to uh, a course that we run that can uh, can help you uh, can help you get across some of those issues. Amazing, thanks, Paul. Mark. Uh, Paul kind of summed it up there. Um, uh, depends what the product is. If it's technology, um, as, as Paul has prepared for it, but whether it's, it's particularly in mobile devices for any spying technology, etc. That obviously, the, in regards to the US, is a great concern. But other than that, it, uh, if it's not, um, there, there obviously is a lot of movement of, of Chinese made goods to the United States, probably the largest trading partner. So it all depends what the product is and what the, maybe what the component might be. But we're delighted to, for Tom to, to connect with us um, after the call and, and um, have a chat and a general how we can maybe help um, with a lot of these questions and, and uh, help maybe get into the States. So Tom, we, we reach out to us and we'd love to connect with you. Thanks, Mark. And we have another um, question from the audience. Alison, perhaps I'll come from um, to you on this one first, maybe around mobility as a service, et cetera. Do you see any differences between exporters who are digital tech or service-based companies compared to companies that trade in physical goods? And is it harder for these businesses to get funding and what can they do? Actually a really interesting question. And I think, um, <clears throat> I think, It's, from my experience and my kind of area of expertise is the Middle East um, from my, my kind of earlier career, um, sometimes it's easier for a kind of a, a client, a buyer to kind of understand a physical product. Um, sometimes these kind of more sort of digital solutions that can be used in, in a number of different ways. Um, they might find, they may, if they, they, they kind of know their sector, it's not a problem, but they might find it harder. And I think some, some companies can be very broad, I think, when they go into a new market and they're not necessarily specific in terms of, of kind of where they're targeting to kind of get that first client and open up. So I think, I think I don't see a huge difference at the moment in the UK. Um, I think it is, it's it's hard, I think, at the moment for a lot of SMEs to, to attract funding. Um, there's a lot of competition. Um, there's a lot of kind of, you know, post post Brexit, post COVID, there's a lot, there's a lot going on and, and a lot of people kind of fighting for the same um, opportunities. But I think um, it, it is, it's a, it's a good question, and I, I don't think that's a particularly good answer for, for it, but um, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that, but I, I don't see, I don't see a huge difference um, at the moment. Um, I think it's, it's more, you know, having access to the right funders, so whether that's through, you know, for example, some of the accelerator programs that we would run, and then you'd be introduced um, as part of that to, to funders who were interested in that, so I, I guess, I, sorry, that's not a particularly good answer. <laughs> No, thanks, Alison. I appreciate your contribution on that. Francisca, do you see any sort of challenges with perhaps the trade finance aspect of this? Is it easier or harder for, you know, tech companies or service based companies to get funded by trade finance versus those who trade in physical goods? Um, I have two thoughts. The one related to the earlier, earlier discussions around um, trading goods from from China and Russia into, into the US and, and banks having to work, uh, uh, follow the regulations and do transactional checks. And we do that at onboarding stage um, by process code known as Know Your Customer, KYC. Um, but what I would say is that whenever you have a transaction in mind, which is new, new counterparties, new jurisdictions, again, have an early dis uh, discussion with your bank because um, we can review 
those counterparties and we can think with you if, uh, if, if it is something that the bank can support from a financing perspective. Now, the, the, the second topic uh, that, that Alison already touched upon is it, is it easier to finance goods or services from a trade finance perspective? Normally people think about goods. And the reason we think about goods, you have physical transport from, from A to B and that needs to be financed. And um, uh, you have all kind of uh, risk mitigants and, and, and security that you can um, attach to that financing structure for the bank to get comfort around and physical security um, you can take. So that's that's why when you think about trade finance, you often think about goods, but you can also finance services. So you can then think about financing um, the receivables, for example. Um, um, so um, if you, if on the face of it, goods are easier and goods are more straightforward, uh, but um, services are also financeable. And if they're not by trade finance, they will be by another uh, banking solution. Thanks, Francisca. Mark, do you maybe want to come in on this, you know, from your head of trade perspective? Is it easier to provide, you know, the, the trade services that Invest Northern Ireland offer to companies that are providing service or technologies into America versus physical goods, maybe based on transport issues, etc.? Um, it, it's a mixed bag, to be honest. Um, services can be quite a challenge as well to, to sell because it's not a physical product. Um, it's, it's so they, they, they identify. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. But at, at the end of the day, you, you always have to find somebody to buy your product, whatever it is, if it's a service or a product. And it, it's ultimately somebody makes somebody makes it and somebody needs to buy it. So um, yeah, if, when it comes to services, there's obviously a different route to actually getting the product where there's a lot of this going on SAS now as well. Um, so you don't maybe have to do the, the overseas travel, etc., or the shipment of products. But um, a, a loaded question there, Amy, there's, there's lots of different ways of, of, of routes to market, but I, I would um, uh, both have opportunity, both have opportunity. Thanks, Mark. So we've just um, ended the poll. And um, so our top sort of buyer is um, lack of knowledge or skills on how to actually do international trade. The second highest ranked one then is bureaucracy. And the third one is understanding overseas markets. So I'll just ask in closing from each of the panel, could you come in with sort of a very quick clo closing thought to summarize our session? and perhaps also touch on the poll results and if those are reflective of, of the interactions with SMEs that you engage with, you're preparing to export. Alison, can I kick off with you? Yeah, I would, I would agree with those. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do when we're doing projects which focus on kind of market access and maybe um, we, we tend to operate kind of pre-department for international trade kind of, um, so, so opening up these new routes, routes to trade from that mobility and, and smart city perspective. Um, I think, I think the, the knowledge around the market understanding, you know, as, as Mark pointed out, all the operational um, elements of it, um, which Paul's touched on too. Um, and, and one of the big things we find is, I think, the cultural aspect as well of doing business, um, you know, um, going into markets where it's normal to WhatsApp someone at, at 11 o'clock at night and, you know, that, that, that's how business is done. Um, so I think it's very much we're being quite mindful on the projects that we do that we need to make sure that we have that information um, and if and you know we can signpost as well so very much agree with that I think there's huge opportunity at the moment um, post COVID post Brexit um, there are some really exciting things going on especially around the kind of more more green sustainable um, projects um, in the UK but also globally um, but I think um, what I would say is utilize the the great panel here and the people um, you know have have fantastic knowledge. There's a lot of information there, and, and, and I think you could really go far. Thanks, Alison. Paul, can I come to you next for your closing thoughts? Uh, I'm feeling particularly shameless. I've just put a link to uh, a page with all of our training courses uh, on it in the chat. Uh, we've got things like uh, customs documentation and procedures, how to classify your goods. Uh, excise duties and procedures, uh, completing customs declarations, you know, all those things around making trade happen and making trade, you know, trade facilitation um, that I think are probably are perhaps coming out in uh, in that poll result. Um, so yeah, sorry, um, 
as far as summing up goes, this is a shameless plug. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Mark? Um, honestly, no surprise. Those would be the pain areas, and those are the areas that would be of concern to anybody wanting to, to start exporting. It's already no surprise, but I guess for, for us, the good news is that's what we're here for. Um, that's those the, those we that's what we're that's really why we exist to try and help companies understand uh, the bureaucracy, all the issues about shipping, etc., and the market intelligence. So I guess I understand those would be the, the concern areas, but I guess the good news is that that's why we exist. So hopefully, you know that that we can we can help our exporters navigate those, those um, problem areas. Thanks, Mark. And finally, Francisco, I'll just come to you. Yeah, I've, I've heard shameless a, a few times. I think that, you know, exporters need to be shameless and use your connections and use the connections of your connections of your connections. The, you know, the, the ecosystem is there. It's built via the service providers, such as banks. You need to tap into it. You need to tap into it early. And I think it's also um, uh, not always necessary to wait for that one big contract. You need to start, uh, you can start small. And, and you'll have to invest in that because if you start small, maybe the, the profit is uh, less significant, but you start to create a track record. So you need to dip your toes in the water and, and test it out. Thanks, Francisca. And thanks to the panelists um, for your contribution during this session and for doing my job for me and perfectly summarizing up the conversation that we've had um, this afternoon. It's been a super interesting session. If you're joining us um, for Future of Strategy Week, please don't miss the next session at 2 p.m. It's a fireside chat with our CEO, um, Rebecca Harding, alongside the former German ambassador to the UK and the Assistant Secretary General for Operations at NATO. And they'll be exploring the topic strategy and sustainability, the challenges that lie ahead. And also um, please do um, join us at 5 p.m. this evening with my colleague, Katie who will be giving a demo on our products and what Coriolis are doing in this space to support banks, economic development agencies, accelerators and industry and trade organizations to facilitate SMEs access to trade finance and find out about marketing opportunities for their product or services. So thank you again for joining us and a huge thanks to our panelists. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.